Welcome to GabFest Reads. I'm David Plotz, one of the hosts of Slate's Political GabFest. There is almost no novelist I read as often and with as much pleasure as Tom Parada. He writes books about everyday people, very often in New Jersey, grappling with the modest indignities and annoying conflicts of regular life. Parada's characters are extremely human, which is to say they are generally weak in small ways and kind in medium-sized ways. His books, which include The Leftovers, The Abstinence Teacher, Little Children, and Mrs. Fletcher, to name four of my favorites, are also very funny, which is one reason why they're always becoming great TV shows and movies. And we are here today because Tom Parada has a new novel that's a sequel to perhaps his most famous book, Election. Its title is Tracy Flick Can't Win, and that title is a glorious beacon that we are about to spend 250 pages in the presence of one of the most interesting and unquestionably most important characters in recent American culture. Tom Parada, welcome to GabFest Reads. Oh, hi, David. I'm so happy to be here. So what has happened to Tracy Flick, the hero or anti-hero of your book, Election, between the end of Election and the beginning of Tracy Flick Can't Win? When we left Tracy in Election, she had been restored to her rightful place as the president of her high school, which her teacher had tried to uh, deprive her of through fraud. Um, And it looks like she's on the way to fulfill her pretty large ambitions for herself. Um, She's off to Georgetown, and um, it seems like the election uh, was just a bump in the road. And, And But like a lot of us, Tracy has found that life is full of additional obstacles. And instead of being, you know, a congressperson or a district attorney, as she had planned, she actually finds herself um, an assistant principal in a public high school in New Jersey. And the book kind of gets into, you know, the backstory of how she got diverted from uh, her plan. She was in Georgetown Law School, and she had to um, leave to do some family uh, caretaking and um, never quite got herself back on track. And She's an excellent assistant principal, and uh, she's a a single mom. And uh, when the story starts, she finds out that the principal is retiring and she has a chance to go for the top job. So all these years later, we see Tracy kind of where she was before, just um, fighting for, uh, you know, the next rung up the ladder in a public high school in New Jersey. When did you decide to revisit Tracy, was there a single moment that prompted you to come back to her? Because she's so indelible to so many people. When did you realize you needed to 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 check in on her again? Well, like most things that happen in novel writing, for me anyway, um, it wasn't so much a decision as a kind of realization. So I'd started a book that really was a I, I wanted to write about um, a football player with a, a traumatic brain injury. Um, who is brought back to his high school to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And and it was kind of, to me, a, a really interesting image uh, or emblem of like where American masculinity is right now. Like we've had our golden boy days and now we're suffering the hangover and the culture is no longer um, quite so reverential as it, as it used to be for lots of good reasons. Um, and when I started to write this book about this high school Hall of Fame and this football player, um, I found myself writing it as if it were a lection. And I was with these sort of small chapters from different perspectives. And I felt like I was uh, kind of copying myself and I felt uncomfortable. But I I seemed compelled to do it that way. And then at one point I just said, wait a second, is Tracy Flick here? Um, Because election just brings Tracy to my mind. And, and, And suddenly I saw it, that she was there in this high school. And I, I know that sounds maybe a little naive when a writer says that, but that's how it feels sometimes. Like, uh, oh, that's what I was, what is doing. So that's my writing story. The other story, though, I think, is that Me Too happened um, in the years before I started this book. And it made me think about Tracy and the way that I'd portrayed her in election. Um, because in election, she has an affair, affair, a sexual relationship um, with a teacher. And she is very much, you know, very defiant about this. Um, She says, you know, it was her choice to start it. It was her choice to stop it. And 
she's fine and she's going to continue on with her life. And, and uh, it's the teacher who is the big baby, you know, and, and it sounds now, I think, like, um, y- you know, I, I don't know. I, I felt like it was was that a fair representation? And I wanted to see what Tracy would think about it now in the light of um, an entirely different cultural framework, because it really was. I think in the early 90s when I wrote this book, um, people were still trying to figure out like, well, what? is this always wrong? <laughs> you know, I mean, now we say, yes, it's always wrong. You know, we all know it. And, uh, but at that time, I think there was a little bit of this, uh, sexual revolution hangover that basically said, well, two people consent, you know, we didn't have the same sense of power relationships and, um, et cetera. I mean, that said, Tracy was 15. And I think, um, I wanted to go back and, and look at that again and, and see, how she would feel about it. So, so I think this book is an attempt to revisit um, the events of election from this particular very changed moment in our cultural history. I, I'm, I'm sure you're so tired of answering this question I'm about to ask, ask but so it goes. Uh, that's what you get for creating somebody this memorable. So you created Tracy Flick out of your head in the book election, but the culture gives life to to characters that lives of their own and tracy flick is now also reese witherspoon and she is also more more kind of weirdly she's also hillary clinton so do you, when you're writing tracy flick now are you writing your tracy flick or do you feel like she she has um pieces of her are the ways in which pieces of her come from hillary clinton or come from reese witherspoon's tracy flick uh, well, it, you know, I think that I'm in conversation with those phenomena because uh, it, it's a very unusual run for a character to have to start out as a character in a you know small literary novel that didn't get a lot of attention. It gets adapted into a film, and you know the character is portrayed by this young actress that no one's ever heard of, and it really puts Reese Witherspoon on the map. And it's really an extraordinary performance that that she gave for Tracy Flick. And then, I think because there just weren't a lot of fictional models for um, women politicians and ambitious women, um, Tracy got sort of adopted as shorthand. And at first that shorthand was for an unpleasantly ambitious woman who, um, you know, alienated the men around her. She became like a sexist stereotype, I think. Um, and Hillary Clinton was sometimes, uh, labeled as a Tracy flick, as you say, but so were almost every other, um, woman politician out there. Kirsten Gillibrand was called Tracy Flick by other senators. Elise Stefanik is sometimes mentioned as a a Tracy Flick. I think, you know, um, there are others if you want to go back and look. But I think, um, yes, Hillary was the most important there. And I would say that the title, Tracy Flick Can't Win, is in a sense um, at least tapping into that Hillary Clinton uh, as Tracy association. I think because in, in election, Tracy feels like what happens to her is very personal. There's a teacher who has a grudge against her for very personal reasons. But in Tracy Flick Can't Win, when Tracy suddenly realizes that she may not become the principal of this high school, even though she deserves it, um, she starts to realize that it's not because anyone has anything personal against her. It's just because the system is set up to admire and honor uh, and place in positions of responsibility um, people who are very different from her, uh, uh, men, (laughs) you know, and that Tracy Flick can't win because some guy is always going to win. And and I think that was certainly one of the, you know, lessons of of the 2016 election. The action of the book revolves around Tracy being pulled into drama when the president of the school board gets it in his head that the school needs a hall of fame and a committee is established to decide who should be the first inductees. So I love this, this trope of the hall of fame. What made you realize that a hall of fame, a school hall of fame would be a great locus for conflict? This is one of the things I think that happens when you become self-conscious as a writer. It was like when I wrote election, I thought, Oh, to tell a political story set 
you know, in a high school election really felt wonderful and counterintuitive. And I, I knew there would be some comedy that came out of that. But um, also, I had this feeling of like, oh, yeah, high school is a microcosm and politics are politics, you know. And, and so I had that feeling. And I think, it, you know, obviously then the first time it's an insight, the second time it becomes maybe a model, you know. And I kept thinking like, well, I don't want her to be really in another election. But, um, you know, democracy happens at so many different levels in in our society. And, and this idea that there's a committee and the committee is going to vote and everything is depending on, you know, who, what, who can get three votes in this five person group, you know, so it really was another kind of election, but, um, you know, I think fame itself and high school fame seems both very small and very representative of bigger things. You know, we live in this, you know, if, if I don't know about your high school, but in my high school, if there's a hall of fame, it's mostly the great athletes who went, went to the high school, you know, that's what we honor. And, and, this uh, Kyle, the president of the school board, pitches to Tracy, we're going to start a Hall of Fame and it's going to be inclusive. It's going to honor artists. It's going to honor musicians. It's going to honor business people. It's going to honor even stay-at-home moms. We could, we could even honor stay-at-home moms. And, um, and then when they get into a room with five people, bam, they go right, right to the, the football player. And, and Tracy is exasperated because it's like, that's her life in shorthand. There's always some golden boy football player who is being um, honored in a way that he probably doesn't deserve. One of the things that struck me reading Tracy Flick Can't Win in the shadow of what's happening in, in actual America is that it's actually a much gentler America and it's a much gentler set of school conflicts than we're seeing. That if you look, and I bet this is true in New Jersey high schools, uh, as well as high schools in other parts of the country, there's this explosion of quite poisonous political conflict in areas that were previously like a little bit politically neutral. Um, not politically neutral, but the, 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 the fights in schools weren't, weren't as sort of directly red-blue as they become over masks, over vaccination, over the teaching of history, over how we welcome or don't welcome trans and gay kids to schools. And... Why do you think it is that public schools are the locus right now of so much conflict? And does it worry you that it's so vicious? You know, that, that's a really interesting question from my perspective. I wrote a book called The Abstinence Teacher. You mentioned it before. Yeah, exactly. You, pre, you prefigured it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that was really set in um, what now seems like the halcyon times of, you know, 2004 when George W. Bush uh, you know, decided that he could get reelected by, um, you know, pushing against gay marriage. And there was a, a basically the, the culture wars in schools then were sort of in shorthand, like evangelical Christians versus secular liberals. And it was often around issues of um, of sex education, you know, and I really wanted to get at that. And I think, you know, I, I wrote a book that was really about trying to bridge a culture war divide in, in this um context of, of one suburban town. Um, and you're right, you know, when, when I, Tracy Flickant, when was really about, you know, who are we going to put in the Hall of Fame? It's a, it's not really a, a culture war issue exactly, but it, it is sort of about gender in a kind of traditional sense, like, like we prefer a football player over, um, you know, a, a woman administrator, <laughs> you know, for, for principal or whatever. Um, but uh, it was also I was writing it, you know, during the pandemic and and I and during the Trump administration. But I wasn't really responding to that. I'd say I was responding to the era, you know, the Me Too era, right, right before all that. Um, but I, to, to answer your other question, I've always felt like high school is a real my, public high school, especially is a real microcosm of of America. And it's just for me, you know, I went to a working class public high school in New Jersey, and then immediately uh, went to Yale. And I could feel like I just landed in a different world. Like, you know, I went in in our own uh, contemporary terms from, you know, real America to elite America. And um, that is like the cultural divide that, that we have right now. And, and um, 
I think that high school maybe for a lot of people is, especially a lot of people who made that jump into elite America, is the last time that they were part of real America. And, and, and high school and school boards are really direct democracies. You know, we have a town trying to make decisions about how they're going to raise their kids and what their kids are going to read and, and um, what values the adults are going to tell the children are important. And these things, which used to be, I think, uh, part of a broad consensus, have become now the subject of, you know, bitter, bitter splits that make, I think, makes us all wonder, are, are we still a community? Do we still function as a, as a political collective that makes sense. Hey, it's Lizzie O'Leary here, host of What Next TBD. Do you ever wish all your podcasts were ad-free? Well, Slate has a very sweet deal for you. For a limited time, you can get six months of Slate Plus for just $29. That's 50% off. With your membership, you get no ads on any of our podcasts, unlimited reading on the Slate site, and member-exclusive episodes and segments on shows like Slow Burn and Political Gab Fest. Why don't you guys like the monarchy? What's, what's not to like about it? Constitutional monarchies are the most functional governments in the world. Did you read about how Charles has just gotten incredibly wealthy off of this whole thing and just thought a little bit about how colonialist the entire tradition is? Like, are you just hand-waving at all of that? Want to hear what your favorite hosts are really thinking? Slate Plus is the only way to access this content. Sign up now at slate.com slash podcasts plus. Again, that's $29 for six months of your Slate Plus membership. This deal ends after October 28th, so sign up now at slate.com slash podcasts plus. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. What happens to a country under maximum stress? Just look at America's home front at the dawn of World War II. When you look at a society that's fighting for its survival, I think you really see the best and the worst come to the top. I'm Josh Levine. In the fourth season of Slate's podcast, One Year, we're going back to 1942, telling stories from the distant past that sound like they've been pulled from the present day. You'll hear about runaway inflation and the man who was desperate to stop it. Maybe all Americans will be a little bit colder this winter, but as a result, it's going to be hotter for Hitler. About how the country dealt with massive loads of disinformation. You have the people who are just like, look, the government's making all this up. And about a worker revolt that changed music forever. We're going to put a ban on recordings. We're not doing this anymore. One Year, 1942, coming on October 20th. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Did you have a research process for this book? Did you immerse yourself in a high school? The writing was happening during the pandemic. Um, and I think one of the things that's changed, and it is, I think I'd love to talk to other novelists about this. Um, you know, in the past, I would always do like almost like a ritual trip. Like when I wrote The Abstinence Teacher, I went to a Promise Keepers convention. And, and uh, it was, you know, it was really a kind of an amazing experience to go to some place that I would never go before. Um, and, in, it, you know, when I wrote The Wishbones, which was a book about a wedding band, I went and followed a wedding band on one Saturday from the, you know, packing up their equipment to playing the gig to, you know, going out afterwards and, and talking about it. Um, but in this case, like, like, I really had to understand what it would be like to be um, somebody applying for the job of high school principal. And so I could have, could be a responsible reporter and go out and find somebody who'd done it. But it just turns out there are these websites that are like, okay, you're applying for the job of high school principal. And, and they give you a step-by-step -step, um, breakdown of what that process is. And there's a lot of um, discussion forums and, and Q&As. And so people are talking about their experiences. And it's like an incredibly efficient way to um, – get yourself immersed in what, what this process would be like. Um, it, uh, you know, Tom Wolfe would, would, <laughs> would not be happy, you know? I mean, I think there are novelists who really, you know, get out in the world and do a lot of firsthand reporting. And um, I, I would say that there's a certain 
you know, indolence involved with, uh, you know, just, just checking these websites. But I, I find that there's just a lot of really, a lot of different people are weighing in. So you're hearing more voices than you might hear if you just found one person and interviewed them and, and heard what their um, experience was like. We all use the web for all of our research now. Novelists, no novelists. Um, let's go back to Tracy for a second. So Tracy is incredibly great at her work as assistant principal, but she's not particularly good with deep emotional connections. She's, she is a mother, but she's not really attached to other, other people closely. What is it that is motivating her? One of the things that Tracy is doing in this book, she's, she's in her forties now and she's thinking about the past and how it is that, um, her life hasn't quite turned out the way that, that she wanted it to. And, and one of the things she's grappling with, um, is her relationship with her mother. Um, in, in election, her mother is, is, you know, a, a, a feminist of sorts. She's a, a, a legal secretary. She didn't go to college. Um, she is a single mom. Tracy's her only kid. And she just gives all of her ambition to her daughter. And Tracy is basically trying to succeed to fulfill her mother's dreams. In a way, she's like, uh, you know, like a young tennis prodigy or a, um, one of those kids. She, she, she has to, feels like she has to earn her love by succeeding. And she is also a complete individualist. You know, she is a product of the meritocratic culture that tells people who don't have a lot, like, you can succeed in this culture by being better than everyone else and setting yourself apart from other people. And, and you know, there's a loneliness in Tracy in a sense that her mother was the only person who ever really loved her um, that uh, has left her, I think, very isolated as an adult. And and part of this book is, you know, Tracy trying to find a way or, or being surprised by the fact that she's making a friend or finding some connection with, um, with another person. And it's, it's not really a love story, but it's about, you know, um, I think people have remarked a lot about just how lonely Americans are. And a part of it is that we just live in a culture that tells us we're competing with the people around us. You know, we're not um, necessarily uh, cooperating with them or, or finding community with them. And, and Tracy is, is like a product of, I think, this era of like unbridled meritocracy that's now being critiqued, but was not being critiqued when Tracy was in the thick of it. Almost everything you write ends up as a movie or TV show. And in particular, You've had a really incredible group of actresses portraying your characters, not just Reese Witherspoon, Kate Winslet and Little Children, Catherine Hahn and Mrs. Fletcher, Regina King, Amy Brenneman, among many others in The Leftovers. Why do you think it is you've had so much success creating vivid women like Tracy Flick and others and and being such a magnet for actresses who want to play them? It, it, it was a really interesting journey for me as a writer, because when I started out, um, I wrote a lot about growing up among, uh, you know, being a boy and then being a man. And, and I was often connected to Nick Hornby in this uh, genre called lad lit, you know, because I wrote about guys in rock bands and I wrote about uh, male friendships and um, working class men. And I think Election was the first book where I realized, like, I have to write women characters because I want I had this idea of telling the story from multiple perspectives and everyone involved. And and it was scary. And, you know, it wasn't so much the identity politics of it at that time. Like I, I to, for me to write a woman was more like a, a writerly challenge. Like, do I have the chops to create a believable woman character from the inside? And and um Election was my first real go at that, and it was really um, a wonderful experience for me as a writer because I, like, I just need to find something in myself that I can share with that character and I can build from there. So with Tracy, it was like ambition. I had I had that ambition. I was a young kid, you know, from a, a small blue collar town, you know, trying to get make my way through this, like, you know, Ivy League school. And, and, you know, I had to just keep building myself up. And, and uh, you know, there was just this inner uh, 
monologue that I understood, like, you know, of the person who's, you know, fighting his way or her way through. That That's where it started. It gave me some confidence to do it. And then I found that I was really interested in the women of, of my generation in particular, who were like that first generation. I, I was in college in the early 80s. Um, and, you know, this was the first generation of girls post Roe v. Wade. Um, you know, they were assumed that they could do anything and, and, and have any, have it all, you know, that was, it was that moment, you know, of the feminism that said a, a woman can do anything a man can. And, and, um, and I remember these sort of idealistic dorm room conversations where we thought we could, you know, have a 50, 50 marriage and the men could take care of the kids and the women could have careers and we'd all figure it out, you know, and then, and there's definitely been progress, like huge amount of progress since that time for some people. Um, but, you know, obviously not complete progress. And, and a lot of women found that that those promises didn't hold up and that patriarchy was much more stubbornly, <laughs> you know, powerful than, than they realized. And it's just been, I think just from the perspective of a novelist, it's, it's, that's been the story has been like, um, feminism and gender and, and how these sort of cultural changes have affected just our daily lives. Like, how do we live? How do we think about marriage? How do we think about sex? How do we think about child rearing? Um, you know, I, I feel like that's always been, um, you know, where novels can do things that uh, other kinds of um, artistic endeavors can't do, which is just talk about how our private worlds are in conversation with um, with culture in general and, and ideas. What books have you read recently that you loved? One book I read recently that I really loved um, uh, is a book called Red Comet, which is a, um, a really long biography of uh, Sylvia Plath by Heather Clark. And I think if you think you know Sylvia Plath, um, read this book because I think it will give you a very um, different uh, take on her. It's, it's, it, um, and in fact, she did remind me in a sense of a proto Tracy Flick. She was um, incredibly ambitious a uh, woman who was ahead of her time. She, I think, was often felt like she was performing on behalf of her mother, who um, her, who was widowed and and really was, you know, encouraging Sylvia to kind of live out her own literary dreams. One of my very favorite works of art, also a small work of art, is the Before series of movies, Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, Before Midnight, which catch these characters at different stages of their life. So I'm asking you to promise here, to swear here, that you will have a third Tracy Flick novel that sees her at the end of her career or the end of her life. Will you make that promise? uh, Yeah, (laughs) yeah, sure. (laughs) I have a sign it in blood. (laughs) Um, No, I would, you know, it's so funny. It took me 20 years to um, revisit, uh, to revisit Tracy, almost 30, actually. Um, So... You know, I don't know. I'm, I'll be an old man if I wait that long again. So I'll have to do it sooner. At least you know you have one one more book in you. At least you know. <laughs> at least you have one book that you know you have to write. I know it's good to have plans. Tom Prada's book is Tracy Flick Can't Win. It's wonderful. Get it. Thanks for coming on Cat Best Reads, Tom. Uh, thanks for having me, David. I appreciate it. <laughs> 